Hello, welcome everyone to this webinar with Brad Philpot. That's me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm here in Cambridge at the Soundproof Studio, as you can see. And it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about the new language and literature course that the IB has recently released and about my textbook on that same topic called English A Language and Literature for the IB Diploma, a very original title. Um, I see 14, 15 of you have logged in already. I expect that number to grow in the next few minutes. I'll introduce myself briefly. I am a textbook author, as you, can, as you know, and an examiner and a workshop leader for the IB and have been so since 2011. I, I started teaching uh, first for the IB programs in 2005. Um, I no longer teach at a school. Uh, but I love to write textbooks and work with teachers and give workshops. So we have 30 minutes here and I'm going to jump into things. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can. And I'd invite you to use the Q&A box in Zoom in order to do that. You can, if, if you chat in the chat box, I will not be viewing those questions. Um, oh, great. I see people are logging in from Riyadh. Excellent, all corners of the world. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Again, if you have questions, use the Q&A box and my panelist, who's sitting next to me here, will answer those questions. And, I'll, and help me answer them as well too. I'll switch over to screen sharing mode now and I'll uh, share my PowerPoint with you that I have on this new guide, guide to the guide. And we'll take it from there. So, um, Yes. Oh, this is good. So I'll start with uh, why we teach language A, language and literature. Or if you're teaching literature, I think you'll find a lot of this applicable as well, too. We want to develop students' textual analysis skills. That's quite clear. There are about 10 of bullet points in the guide on why we do what we do, the purpose, the learning outcomes, aims. And I've, I've boiled those down to four here. Uh, I really do think the course is about textual analysis and the powers of expression, getting students to develop their creativity and critical thinking skills. Um, and we hope that they come away with a lifelong appreciation of language and literature, uh, that they enjoy reading, that they're more critical every time they see a commercial. Um, if we do the course successfully, I think it should have a real impact, impact on the students. So. Um, to jump into things, I'll start with the texts and works that we're reading. Uh, because it's a language and literature course, we're exploring a big range of non-literary texts, uh, such as commercials or ads or brochures, posters, um, speeches, uh, you name it. There are quite a few non-literary texts, and arguably the, 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 there's a gray area between what's literary and non-literary. but Technically, we need to select four works for our standard level students and six works for, for higher level students. Uh, you can see I've put in some numbers here for our colleagues who teach literature as well. But if I explore these numbers here, um, SL students read one work from the PRL. This funny acronym stands for Prescribed Reading List. And it is an online database of authors that you can find on the IB's Program Resource Center for Language and Literature. And there are 55 IB languages, and one of those is English. And there are about 300 authors per language. Uh, and so that means it's a very big database. You'll need to explore other languages, PRLs, in order to meet this requirement here for standard level and higher level. Again, one work at SL and two works they read in translation at higher level. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about this last number, uh, freely chosen works. As you can see, uh, students are required or, or can read at standard level two works freely chosen and the same at higher level two works. And the definition of freely chosen is rather broad. It could mean that you as a teacher decide which works they read or you give the students the opportunity to select a literary work for uh, their reading list that meets this requirement. And uh, anything goes in, in theory. Uh, we expect you to use your professional judgment, of course, when selecting texts, um, selecting things that are appropriate for their ability level. Um, 
let's look at some of these reading requirements. So of the four works that students read at standard level, they should have read works from two different time periods, two different places, and two different literary forms. And at higher level, this requirement's an increase from older requirements. Uh, students should have read three different uh, works from three different time periods, works from three different places, and three different literary forms. So time period is defined by century. Place is defined by country and continent. So at standard level, that's two different countries from two different continents. At higher level, that's two different countries from three different continents. And you'll see the PRL has five continents from which you can choose. And uh, literary forms is the new word for literary genre. And you'll see that the IB has clearly defined four genres, prose fiction, prose nonfiction, drama, and poetry. Arguably there are six, but uh, we put song lyrics. Yes, singer songwriters are on the list, a lot of them. They go under poetry and graphic novels go under um, prose fiction or nonfiction, depending on the nature of the, uh, the graphic novel. Um, but those are the reading requirements. <clears throat> and you'll also notice that the guide asks you to um, have at least one work from each exploration area of, of exploration at standard level and two works for each area of exploration at higher level. Uh, what is AOE or area of exploration? It's, um, I suppose it's, it's the Ivy's answer to parts. For those familiar with the old guide, the dying guide, current guide, it, uh, um, th there are no more parts, uh, but we have these areas of exploration. And actually, if you ask me, they're more or less approaches to analyzing texts. Uh, readers, writers, texts, is uh, there, there are six questions that accompany this area. And they ask you essentially to look at the formal elements of a text, the style, the structure, and try to ascertain the author's purpose through that, or try to ascertain how a reader might respond based on those structural and formal elements. Time and place, there are six questions to go with these as well. And those questions encourage uh, students to uh, understand the importance of context in shaping meaning. And intertextuality is a, a curious term, but what it means basically is that we're either comparing texts or looking at texts within texts uh, and, and asking students how to ascertain meaning doing that. So uh, pastiche, spoof, parody, uh, homage, all of that is really uh, relevant to intertextuality. And again, there are six guiding questions that go along with that. Um, that means there are in total 18 questions. I've called them guiding questions. I've put those um, all throughout the, uh, the new course book that I've written here for Cambridge. And uh, area, areas of exploration, I'll talk a little bit about um, course design. And you might be tempted to structure your whole teaching around these. But uh, that, that would be a difficult approach, uh, I think, because you'll find that multiple questions are relevant for multiple literary works and non-literary texts that you read. So I'm not sure if this is the most um, relevant guiding principle when it comes to course design. I've structured the, um, the course book uh, instead around global issues, which I'll come to in a moment. Again, here's kind of the model for reader-writer text. I got ahead of myself on the PowerPoint, I'll catch up. Here's a model for time and place. And here's a model for intertextuality, comparing texts. And here's another model for intertextuality, looking at texts within texts. Um, so the, uh, the guiding questions that go with each area of exploration are rather conceptual. You'll see words like transformation, in those questions or creativity or communication. And uh, there are seven prescribed concepts. Uh, arguably, there are many, many more concepts that are relevant for our course, such as meaning or purpose or audience. And uh, I'd encourage you to, to explore those as well. Um, yeah. And the idea of you know, teaching for conceptual understanding is a, an approach to teaching, an ATT at the IB. And, um, the idea behind that is that students start to see connections and make links and find patterns when analyzing texts. I, um, I, I don't really think we should walk into the classroom and um, teach concepts directly. 
as such. Instead, it's more of a process of discovery. If you want to read more of Lynn Erickson's work on teaching for conceptual understanding, I'd recommend that. Um, but these are useful tools, certainly, when it comes down to some of the assessment components. I'll come back to concepts. Um, the global issues, <clears throat> in the guide you'll find five areas of global issues, and uh, these look like themes. You'll notice some of these issues are, have the same, are, are actually concepts. You saw those on the previous list, which could be confusing, but really if, if you take an area like culture, identity, and community, um, there are specific um, issues that could go within this that you can define with your students. So isms tend to work well as global issues. Uh, here's an example, um, you know, sexism, racism, uh, colonialism, uh, all of these meet the criteria. They're significant, they're transnational, they're relevant to local contexts. Um, arguably something like hashtag me too or a hashtag black lives matter are subsets of these issues. But if you want to spend two or three weeks with your students exploring hashtag me too or racial profiling or coming of age or parenting or, or anything that you want to define with your students as a global issue and that meets those three criteria, then uh, by all means do so. Um, here's an example of how I would put it all together. Uh, topics and texts or issues and texts or themes and texts. Um, here you see a guiding question. How has racism been addressed, say throughout the decades um, by multiple authors? And you could take some race ads from Benetton's from the 90s or uh, Richard Wright's Black Boy or I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King and approach them differently using different areas of exploration and you could ask different questions from those AOEs and assign students different learner portfolio assignments. I'll come to that in a moment too. But for me, um, it's, it's really the course should be designed around topics or issues uh, that appeal to students uh, where students could also become very much involved. Here you see three texts and Maybe you can get students to hunt and gather and find um, more texts that would be uh, relevant to this theme and document their learning experiences with those texts in the learner, learner portfolio. So I'll jump into assessment. Um, first, I'll, I'll look to my panelists here who's next to me and, and, and ask if there are any questions coming through the Q&A now. Um, There's no, there, we haven't got any, have any questions yet. Okay. Um, I see a few questions here in, in the Q&A okay. box. Um, I'm not sure if, I'm, if everyone can see everyone's questions. No, okay. <laughs> um, here, ha anonymous attendee has asked, has this changed from the previous guide and how? Uh, I'd appreciate with, when you ask questions in the Q&A box to be specific with words like this. Um, AOEs are certainly different from, say, well, here's a similarity. I think global issues could be compared to the old topics that we had in parts one and two. Um, and uh, should we address all three AO, AO, AOEs, areas of exploration, with each text studied? No, you don't have to. This is a question from Drelf. And um, you don't have to necessarily explore all three AOEs with each text you might find that one set of questions is relevant for one text, one set of questions is relevant for another text. You might find that a combination of questions is relevant for a certain text. The guide is a little bit prescriptive in saying that you should spend so many hours, like 50 hours at higher level on each um, AOE. Although that, it sounds quite prescriptive, I would really just ignore that and assume that, you know, you'll through a balanced selection of work and um, uh, you'll, um, explore all of them. Uh, yeah, so um, we'll uh, continue with some more questions here and I'll make James a panelist as we go. Um, yes, maybe you could help me with that. Um, I'll move on to the next slide here, talk about assessment and, uh, and give you an overview of that. So, as you can see, the percentages have changed because there are fewer components of assessment. And, all right, yeah. So, and the percentages are also not the same for HL and SL. <laughs> That's my assistant. I think everyone can see you there, Tamsin. Looking great. All right, good, great. So, James is now on as my uh, panelist. Um, 
it's a higher stakes game really for paper one, paper two, especially for standard level when they only have three components of assessment. Um, and we'll look at each component here in detail. So, um, oops, uh, to get to the next slide, there we go. So paper one, HL and SL students receive the exact same exam booklet. And that exam booklet contains two texts, um, text one, text two. There's an element of choice for standard level students. They choose the text they like or feel is, is richest in meaning. And they have an hour and 15 minutes to write a guided textual analysis on, on that. It's called guided textual analysis because each text in the exam booklet for both HL and SL is accompanied by a question. And the question is text specific and it connects form and meaning or, or theme and, uh, and, and style, if you will. So um, again, there's an element of choice for standard level, but not for higher level. Uh, their higher level students analyze uh, both texts separately. So hopefully within an hour and seven minutes, they finish their first analysis and then they've got another hour and seven and a half minutes to write their second analysis. You can imagine how this exam would be run possibly even in the same room, uh, and the SL students just simply leave after, after a while. Um, I have some explanation up here on the slide as well for lit teachers among us, um, but you can see the, the texts for Lang and Lit are very non-literary, they'll be very visual, and it, for liter the literature teachers here on, on, the, on the webinar, uh, those are just literary texts. Um, Let's see, do we have questions about paper one coming through the Q&A box? I haven't received any yet. I can't see the questions that were there before. But All I right. I haven't received any new questions. Okay. I'll move on and talk about uh, paper two now. And I see we've got another 15 minutes or so to wrap this up. Um, so I'll, I'll keep moving at a good pace. Uh, comparative essay. Uh, paper two is very similar to the old paper two, except this word comparison. Uh, and you can see that first bullet point, about 75,000 students in the world, uh, including both Lang and Lit students and literature students, all of them at SL or HL will receive the exact same exam booklet. And the, uh, they open this booklet to discover four unseen questions. And they have an hour and 45 minutes to write a comparative essay that explores two literary works that they've read and addresses the question. And here we see the first mention of double dipping. Uh, students cannot use works used on an individual oral or an HL essay. So when I said earlier that we no longer have parts, um, instead of connecting parts to assessment components, we need to think about connecting uh, literary works to assessment components. And so when you are selecting those literary works for uh, your students, uh, do keep this in mind that there should be at least two works on those lists um, that, should, that, that could be compared quite, quite nicely. And it helps to think then along the lines of themes or literary form. As a paper two examiner for Lang and Lit, I can say that students who do comment on the same text type, for example, plays or novels, um, just focusing on plays or just focusing on two novels, they tend to be at an advantage. Um, over a student maybe comparing a, uh, uh, a graphic novel or to a, to a novel, for example. It doesn't have to be a recipe for success, but it, it certainly can help. Um, I'll talk about the HL essay now, unless there are questions about the paper two and paper one. There's a few questions have come right. about paper two and paper one. So first of all, with paper two, there's just one question. So um, what kind of questions are there in paper two? Yeah, good question. Um, they're rather similar to past paper questions for Lang and Lit, uh, except now they have a contextual element. So in the past, we noticed trends that there tended to be technique questions. For example, to what degree is the, are, are the works nonlinear, or is there a reliable narrator, or do we see imagery? How do they appeal to eyes and ears? Uh, those types of questions, they'll still be on the exam. There were context questions. So uh, to what extent is a work timeless? horrible question, I know, but it's appeared on the exam multiple times. Um, 
context questions about why the author wrote, how readers have received the works over periods of time. Those will still be on there. Um, you'll see that the IB is publishing teacher support material in April and you'll recognize that those questions are rather similar. So again, technique, context, uh, tend to be two types of questions. And the third type of questions is uh, theme. So there's always been kind of a theme question. Uh, to what degree do these works comment on a human struggle or uh, comment on the notion of justice as expressed in these novels uh, or literary works? That, um, that type of question will, will still be there, but all these questions will just have a comparative element now. Again, it used to be an hour and a half at standard level and two hours at higher. Now all students just have an hour and 45 minutes. I, I think if I can give my opinion, this might be the most difficult form of assessment. Um, and it's a high stakes game for SL students with 35% um, and at, at HL it's 25% still. Any other questions? Another question on paper yeah. two, sorry. Yeah. Another question on paper two is how long is paper two? Uh, yeah, an hour and 45 minutes. An hour and 45 minutes. Um, a, an, and Okay, and a question here, another question from David Nelson. So if they do two novels, then that takes up half of the SL course. That's unbalanced, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. I see where you're coming from, uh, David. That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, then they would have, for their individual oral, uh, they would have two works to choose from, um, arguably. Still, there's a, a one element of choice, but yeah, it's, it's limiting. Um, I, I can't do anything about the fact that there are, are only four works to read at standard level. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Rafaela saying, will the webinar be recorded? And yes, the webinar will be recorded, Rafaela. Um, and there were some questions on paper one. Do you want to answer some questions sure. on paper one as well? Yeah. yeah I saw another housekeeping question about mm -hmm. the webinar being, or the slides being made available. And I think the answer to that is yes as well too. Um, for paper one then, can, can we still use the existing paper one questions, the existing, the existing paper one past papers so for practice with HL yeah. students? Yeah, I think that um, most relevant past papers would be SL. Uh, even So with your HL students, it would be good to dig up some old standard level paper ones and practice those with SL and HL students. Essentially, in the future now, as, as you know, first teaching 2019, uh, this year and first exams 2021, um, the, we need to practice a close analysis of one single text. There's no longer a comparative uh, element at HL. Uh, I know I'm sad to see that go as well. I thought it was a, a brilliant form of uh, assessment, but um, so it goes. I guess we're doing comparison now uh, for paper two only. And then a question from Dave, another question from David Nelson asking if we can see examples of paper one texts. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Uh, the IB is going to be releasing uh, teacher support material in April. Uh, the official IB answer is, of course, you could go there. Um, I, I can't help but promote my own website, philpoteducation.com. We've got a few samples lying around uh, on our support site there. Um, but yeah, it's uh, again practicing with old SL uh, papers and finding examples of old SL um, samples that that's uh, appropriate there. Okay, and I think that's the same question that Drelf, I guess that's not your real name, asked, which is about, about using the current color paper one tests, which are uh, web pages, infographics, etc. Yeah, that's that's good to address. Uh, thanks for asking that, David. Yeah, uh, the texts are very visual, certainly. And I've seen some of the teacher support material already, and I can say that the uh, specimen paper ones are also very, very visual. Uh, one of them is a piece of artwork, actually. It's a, a cartoon, uh, just a single frame with many characters looking rather comical, uh, lots of caricature. Uh, so we need to teach students how to analyze visual texts, and they, they will be in color. And uh, see also past subject reports uh, that's on the... Um, on the PRC from previous papers, they all say the same thing, that students need to explore visual elements in more detail. And moving back to paper two, one last question before yeah. we move on. Uh, Ema asks if the four questions in paper two also have genre or form related questions. No, they don't. 
uh, that's a, a typical literature thing uh, that they've done in the past, but yeah, won't do in the future. And for Lang and Lit uh, teachers out there, uh, we've never had that element. So, um, and it won't won't be there. I'm going to move on to uh, HL essay for the sake of time. I see we've got another five minutes, and um, HL essay is rather straightforward. It's like a shorter extended essay. Uh, it's 1,200 to 1,500 words. It's based on a line of inquiry that st students design, a bit like a research question. And the guide really encourages students to include a concept in there, one of the seven concepts. And um, for Lang and Lit students, it's based either on a literary work, one, or one or more non-literary texts. So like a collection of ads or commercials and such that, that's appropriate there for that. Um, if you think about it, if you have used non-literary texts for HL essay, that frees up a work then for paper two or the individual oral. And keep in mind that we cannot be double dipping or using the same literary works for uh, multiple components here. There will be no penalties, I've been told. So students need to, needn't worry about um, making mistakes with that, but in the spirit of fair assessment, we should encourage them. We need to tell them it's required not to double dip. Um, individual oral. So this one is a new beast altogether, a new form of assessment. It's a little bit like the further oral activity meets the individual oral um, um, commentary. It's now called IO, individual oral. It's on a global issue that the student chooses from their learner portfolio. And uh, they select one of their literary works, uh, take a passage from that, then find a, a non-literary text. It could be screenshots from um, a, a video. It could be um, um, a, 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 like an ad or a brochure, but a non-literary text. And then they write an outline, uh, which should be no more than 10 bullet points. And that outline goes on to an IB form. And then they, they come to the exam room after having told you a week before the exam which literary works or which passages they would explore and they can show you their outline. And there's a lot of guidance for you in the guide about this, but basically it comes down to this. You can hold their hand, but you can't spoon feed them. That's what it comes down to. Um, so uh, you can look at the outline, you can look at their texts, you can say if, whether or not they're appropriate for the global issue that they would like to explore. They come to you, uh, they've prepared this outside of class, uh, they, they give a 10 minute oral. Uh, commenting well, for five minutes on each text, as it were, and then uh, thereafter a, a five-minute discussion ensues. So this is um, a, a tricky form of assessment. I'm sure the IB will have some examples. Again, I have some examples on, on the Philpot website. There will be examples uh, for all of these. Of course, I'm here to promote the CUP, Cambridge University Press textbook, and for both paper one, paper two, HL essay, and the the um, individual oral, there will be uh, two or three examples of each form uh, in the course book. So that's another reason yet for purchasing the, uh, the course book. And uh, for, in the case of the oral, we have a transcript or two transcripts there for the, um, for the oral in, in the course book for you to read and with your students. Yeah. Um, these are the assessment criteria. I know we've run out of time almost. and this is probably a good way to end here. I'll, I've got a few more slides to show about the, the course book, but the assessment criteria are the same for every component. There's a little different weighting, um, a little different wording for each criterion. Uh, you know, understanding interpretation sometimes asks you to focus uh, on a guiding question as well, say for the um, for paper two or, or a line of inquiry for the HL essay or the global issue for the individual oral, but essentially that criterion is the same for each component, just as analysis and evaluation is also the same for each component. Focus and organization sometimes includes balance, for example, with paper two or the individual oral, and language is exactly the same word for word for all components. Four, four criteria. Um, this book can save your life, it seems, and I hope that's not false advertising. Uh, but we, we thought we'd slip this in there as a, a, a final slide. Um, we uh, have seen uh, other textbooks that have just come out, and I, it's safe to say this, this course book certainly has 
a lot to offer uh, when compared to other course books. It's available uh, in August. Um, you can already pre-order on the, uh, the Cambridge website and, or Amazon. And uh, I suppose some of the unique selling points about the book is that it's certainly activity driven. It's uh, a lot of non-literary and literary texts, short texts uh, where you can kind of dip in and dip out, uh, organized around the global issues for the most part, uh, lots of in, in a very in-depth assessment section, but it's all, all activity based. There's no explaining or mansplaining in the course book, I promise. <laughs> We're getting away from that. And uh, yeah, so for first examinations in 2021, as you know, um, yeah, we have uh, a, a strong, strong emphasis there on 21st century skills, um, research skills, ATLs. Uh, they're very much at the core of, of this course book. Uh, it's really meant for classroom use. It invites uh, Class, uh, groups to uh, interact with each other, for individuals to, to engage with the texts, uh, for you as a teacher to get involved in discussions. Uh, there are some games in there and, and, and fun activities. Uh, the higher level extensions, of course, uh, for those extra lessons that you might have with HL students only. Um, yeah, again, there are lots of examples of, of paper one, paper two, individual oral, HLE. And uh, the marginal features throughout. Um, help you connect to the DP core, uh, TOK, extended essay and such. Um, the, D, the, the text, the marginal features also help you connect to international mindedness, things that are really um, part of the, uh, the IB core. Uh, yeah, so did I miss anything? Are there more questions that we need to, to tackle before we wrap up? I realize we've gone two minutes over time now. There were a couple of questions about the individual so um, David asked what sort of global issue you anticipate um, learners to work on. Right, that's a good question. Um, and I, I, I'm going to give, a, give you a tip, or if I were to be teaching a group of students, I really would come in with a somewhat broad issue, so like racism, and, uh, and offer students a few texts on that but encourage students to explore different aspects of that global issue and call that their global issue and document as, they, as, that, as a section in their portfolio. Uh, so if, if one student wanted to focus on racial profiling and another one wanted to focus on um, Black Lives Matter or what have you, then there should be room for a, a student autonomy here and, and choice. So those, those are the types of issues. Again, I would start with isms, feminism, colonialism. Um, that's how I've done it with the, uh, the course book. Uh, you'll notice I've, I've included nine issues there, three per chapter times three global issues chapters. That's a whole section, the second section, the middle section of the uh, of the course book. I hope that helps you there, David. But um, yeah, I would involve students in defining issues. It's a rather expandable term. And then Luke asked a question or a couple of questions. First of all, he asked about, um, he's confused as to what two texts, which two texts students can choose for the individual all commentary one should be language one should be literature correct uh, yeah um, yep. um, and then goes on to ask the guide is confusing says it's not a commentary and should deal with wider aspects yet they should still look at style and diction etc yeah yeah so it is in the sense um like the old ioc it's still careful close analysis of a text but with respect to a global issue so it's not enough just to list uh, onomatopoeia, alliteration, allusion, can be found in this poetry, in this poem, but instead we need to say, students need to focus on the aspects of that poem or, or text that are relevant to the global issue that they've decided on. And there's a guiding question. I, I, I did realize that the guide can be vague, but there's a really clear um, guiding question that goes with the individual oral. I can't recite it word for word, but very closely, I can almost quote it, and it says, um, uh, ex comment on how um, two authors from two texts or works the, um, present the global issue through their texts. So t how is the, the issue presented through language in these two uh, passages or, or excerpts or extracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's quite a lot of questions about the individual. Yeah, I really... Um, it's a, it's a difficult thing, yeah. Mm. There's another one here about um, 
what the outline, what the student's outline for the individual should look like. Yeah, um, again, you'll find ex examples of that in my course book, but um, I wouldn't, so, so the, the guide says 10 bullet pointed, uh, 10 bullet points, that's it. I don't know how long is a bullet point. Um, I would encourage students to use all kinds of formatting tip uh, tricks like, um, uh, like bold um, symbols, uh, arrows, underlining italics, just so that when they have that piece of paper uh, in front of them during the exam, they can quickly identify the features and find the examples that they're looking for. They're not allowed to have annotated copies of the passages with them. So um, indenting, uh, bullets, all of that matters. It can only be on one A4. There's going to be an IB form for this that'll be submitted uh, to IB, uh, IBIS or eCourseWork e or um, through ManageBack if you do it that way. But um, I, I wouldn't use fonts that are too small. I realize that uh, uh, it might sound a little rehearsed, the whole individual oral, and that's the fear of everyone. If students can prepare it on their own time, what if it sounds like a rehearsed response? And I just think that's something we're going to have to accept that you know, students will come hopefully with a thesis statement. Um, they might read that out word for word, but hopefully the rest of it does not sound like it's scripted as such. And there is, um, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Is the five minute discussion after the individual supposed to address both texts equally? Yeah, yeah, it really is. And so uh, it might be an opportunity to discuss, to, to ask students how each text tackles a different aspect of the issue differently. I know it's tempting to compare and contrast. Students are not assessed on their ability to compare and contrast. So, but if that happens during the discussion, it's not a bad thing either. I think it might elicit some of the better uh, analysis. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so, you know, asking two and a half minutes on one text, asking questions for two and a half minutes about the other text seems fair to to encourage balance on which the students are also assessed. Um, and then back to the issues again, are environmental issues included in the issues? Yeah, I know when you hear the phrase global issue, um, then you might think of um, globalization, environmental issues, poverty, uh, those types of issues. Uh, yes, environmentalism, another ism, could be considered a global issue. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, you could get really specific with this if you wanted to. You could say, uh, is wind power a global issue? Um, and I think it could, in all fairness, be a, considered a global issue if that's something that your student wants to explore um, with other students and call it a, uh, an issue, go for it. Yes, by all means. Are, are the issues still language-based? Yeah, so it's a good idea to look at the old guide, um, part one, part two. Remember how it said language and identity, language and the state, language and culture, all of those uh, topics, as they were called then, are still very relevant. So I would ensure that every issue that you explore has a language element, aka a primary source. So every, yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, Reem Amin Urchak said that says that for the IOC they have twenty minutes preparation time. Can they research online before they start talking on it? So Reem. Just to, um, uh, to, to reiterate, uh, students are doing this, on, they're preparing this on their own time. There's no 20 minute preparation time for the IO now. There used to be 20 minutes prep, of course, for the IOC, but now there isn't. It's coursework. So yes, they can go online to find out all kinds of contextual information, to even look to see how other students have analyzed that text um, and, uh, and use that information to inform their uh, the, the way they address the global issue through those texts, certainly. And then one final question, again from Reem. Um, she uh, he says that it feels like it's become more difficult, um, the uh, IB uh, language and literature syllabus, or is that um, just anxiety? That might be anxiety. We, we, we've lost the written task and the further oral activity. Um, whether or not the course has become more difficult, I suppose it is what we make of it. Um, Assessment-wise, it's clear that the IB wants to pitch the Lang and Lit course on a par with uh, the Lit course, uh, because essentially we have the same guide now. Paper two examiners, Lit and Lang and Lit examiners will mark both Lit and Lang and Lit students. 
Um, so in that sense, yes, maybe the courses become more difficult. Um, the stakes are higher with fewer components. Um, I don't know. I think the, the old HL paper one was, was difficult, fun and interesting, and I'm going to miss that. Um, yeah. And there's an, another question has come in, if we've got time for one more. Time oh, one last question. Um, how can the portfolio be used in the coursework preparation for the individual pool? Yeah, well, it says quite clearly in the guide that it's, um, it comes out of the learner portfolio. So the, the IO is the result of the learner portfolio. And two things about the learner portfolio, by the way, it, the guide says it is required and the IB may ask students to, to um, submit it for moderation. In all likelihood that won't happen but it is it's in the guide um, and secondly students should have a list of works read and uh, texts explored uh, in that portfolio so if students are, are constantly gathering texts both literary non-literary um, adding those to the portfolio writing reflection pieces maybe writing written tasks there's no reason why they can't to engage with these texts um, then that will help prepare them for the individual oral and uh, through that experience, they'll find which passage um, they're most successful uh, working with. And um, that's, that's one way, I suppose, of using the learner portfolio as a springboard for the, uh, the individual oral, certainly, yeah. Okay, and uh, thank you from David. All right, thank you. Good questions, David and Reem and others. I appreciate that. Um, again, Please look out for the, um, the new course book. I think this is the last slide. Oh, right, here's, there's it. Great, to find out more, uh, you can send questions to this email address. If you, if you want, Thames and Hart uh, has been a real gem in organizing all of this. I appreciate that. She's sitting here across from me. She says goodbye to you all too, just like James, who's next to me, my editor. And um, take care, best, best of luck teaching this new course. Exciting times are upon us. Embrace them, enjoy them, and good luck. Take care. Bye-bye.